Yeah, what an amazing thing to see. What an amazing thing to see. Man, we're excited that you're here today. Uh, and I just have a question for you that I, uh, that I want you to be completely and brutally honest. Uh, for some of us in this room, it'll be kind of hard to admit this, but I want you to just admit it if you could. Uh, have you ever been lost? Have you ever been lost? Okay. I know, some of the guys are like... You know you have, you just don't want to raise your hand. No, but have you ever been lost and been without directions? That's a tough spot to be in, right? I know nowadays we just open our phone and we have Google Maps and you have directions anytime you want. So you really shouldn't get lost. If you use Apple Maps, you will get lost. Um, I don't know why. Uh, and please don't misunderstand that as I'm a Samsung or an Android guy. I am not, all right? But Apple Maps just stinks. But if you get out there in, and you're lost and then you don't have direction, it can be a little bit of a humbling experience, all right? You think, oh boy, what to do now? I had 14 uh, students with me and some adult leaders a few years back, and we were placed in Los Angeles in the heart of downtown, uh, and we were, in the, we were at the Dream Center, and we were serving different communities, and so every day we'd go out and do different things. Uh, I'm driving a 15-passenger white van, uh, you know, so I got all the pressure on me because I'm driving in L.A., and if you've ever driven in L.A., you know that you have to get off an on-ramp, off an off-ramp, off an off-ramp, off an off-ramp to get to an exit. Right? And so, if, and if you miss one of those, see in an hour, right? So, I have all the pressure in the world to get to these different destinations because we're taking our place, people places. Um, and and one, of our, one of our guys on the trip, uh, we had a little built in GPS in the dash, and uh, he was real fascinated with using that and, and thought that that would be a really good thing to have. And I agreed for a while. And um, so we, we're, we're using that, and it's doing okay. Um, but we get to this one spot, and we are in the middle of the hood of Los Angeles. We are serving people. We are loving people. We spend all day out there, did a little kids' jam thing. It was an amazing time. Everyone's cups are full. And we get in the, we're getting in the van to get to leave, and this little gal who's our missions director, she literally is like this big. When she first came out, I was like, a sixth grader is leading us to the, you know, um, it's true. If you were there, you know, I was like, what? And, uh, but man, she was larger than life and in that space. But when we got to that, she goes, okay, now when we leave, I'll be your guide and you could just follow me back to the dream center. But I'm going to, you have the dream center's address, correct? So you can get back on your own if we get separated. I was like, yeah, it's like I felt kind of better about that. You know, I felt pretty good. And in 4.5 seconds and two left turns, she was gone. And I'm like, well, here we are, right? Okay, we got to get back to Dream Center somehow because that's where we're staying tonight and eating. Um, and so we were like, all right. So we had our directions in the GPS on the dash and we're taking those directions. And after I saw the same billboard the third time, I was like, but if you guys know me, I don't get angry a lot, but it takes a long time to get there. Um, but when I get angry, I just go, silent. And the steam is, is literally coming out my ears as I'm in the van. Hungry, tired, we're probably missing dinner at this point, right? I don't have a clue where we're going. And I just look over to the guy sitting next to me, and he, he goes, um, so uh, um, should, I, uh, put, should, I put, should I put it in my phone? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> right? And everybody, the tension in the van was high, right? It was just, everything was going wrong in that moment. Um, but he was able to get us on there, and, and thank goodness that the directions were like, get over, because in two miles, you're going to have to cross 17 lanes of traffic to take another, you know, it was that kind of stuff. So that helped us out, and we got back to where we were supposed to be. But we were lost in the moment, and we were lost in, those, in that place, and we had no direction. And then we had direction because we had the GPS, but the directions that we had weren't good. And all of a sudden, I'm seeing, I'm seeing this van of students that are hungry that want to go back, and I'm in L.A. in the hood. I don't know where I'm going. I've never been there before. The directions that we're supposed to have are gone. The person that was supposed to lead us, she took off like I lived there or something, and now we're lost with no direction. It's a scary place to be. Sometimes we get lost in other areas of our life with no direction. Parents, come on, somebody. 
right? When you're a parent and you have a kid, there are times where that kid throws things at you or things happen in your life. You're like, man, I am a parent and I am lost and there's no directions. Where's mom? Right? <laughs> you're like, I, my mom would know what to do, you know, and you're trying to figure out how to do this thing. And you get lost in parenting. Sometimes we get lost in our job and our career path. Man, how many people have, in this day and age have gone to college, that have done a four-year degree, and they work a job that has nothing to do with the certificate that they earned, right? Because they think, man, what? I was going to do this, and, and now I'm doing this. And they end up in a place where they're like, man, I'm lost. I don't even like what I do. What am I supposed to be doing? Some of us get lost in our finances. Man, we get, we get so over, over our head in debt or in other things, and we don't know how to manage money, and we don't know how to this and that, and are looking for a Dave Ramsey or somebody to help us out, and we're lost. We're going, where's the direction in this? Sometimes we get lost in our relationships. The marriage that was once steady got off an off-ramp, took a left turn and then a right turn, and you find yourself wondering, where the heck are we now? And we're lost in our relationship with no direction, nowhere to go. See, there's one thing that I know, that I've been lost in the wilderness. I've been lost in places before. And I used to use a map book. (laughs) Anybody remember what those are? (laughs) We used to use a map book, and I used to drive to subdivisions that didn't exist yet um, and deliver stuff. That was fun. Because those subdivisions that don't exist also don't exist in the map book. Right? And so I would drive to these things and oh, man, please, if I turn right, hopefully I see trucks and stuff. Right? So we've all been in those spots, whether it's little like that or big things, we've all been in a place where we're lost and we had directions and they're not good or we didn't have directions and we don't know what we're doing. And the key to that is this. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things will be added unto you. And so what I do in this part And what I do every time I'm found and myself in a lost place, I pray. Join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, I ask this morning as we discover what you have for us this morning, whether we're in a lost place or we're in a good spot, God, I pray that you would guide us and direct us, that you would lead us, that you would speak to us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I also go to the Bible. You pray and you go to the Bible. Right? And, then, and it's, it's amazing. I'm going to show you guys something that, that maybe you haven't figured out yet, but you unlock your phone, you go to a thing called the App Store, and there's this little app on there, and it actually, it says Holy Bible right on it. And you can download it for free. Um, and then there's also paper ones that you can pull out of your nightstand, whoosh, blow the dust off of, cough it up a little bit. And that, it's all sarcasm. Loosen up a little bit. Okay, the Bible is available for you to read, and so I want, I'm encouraging you to read your Bible in these moments of lostness. Go find a spot where you can get into God's Word. The, the, also, the purpose of this is Exodus chapter 1 is where we're going to dig in today, but I'm going to pick it up at 13. So I would encourage you that sometime this week that you go and read Exodus 1 and, and fill in all the blanks. But basically what happens is in Exodus 1, we find the Israelites are oppressed and enslaved by the Egyptians, and they're stuck. Even so much so that the Egyptian midwives had the order that if the Hebrew, midwi- the Hebrew wives were birthing children and they were males, they were to kill them. Because if they, these people are going to outnumber us eventually, and they're going to take over. And so these people were enslaved. They were oppressed. God saves Moses through some, through some Hebrew midwives and through some Egyptian midwives. And that's a story you really should read. There's good stuff in there. And then God raises up Moses, and he speaks to Moses, and he says, I want you to come and lead these people out of captivity, out of enslavement. And, and he says, okay, yeah, but, but I don't speak too good. I don't do that real well. And so he says, hey, I'll bring up Aaron to help you. And so he brings Moses and Aaron, and they go before Pharaoh the king. And, and they said, hey, let my people go. <laughs> and Pharaoh's like, no, I don't think I'll do that, right? We like free labor here. Um, and they're like, no, you better because... If you don't, you know, some stuff. And they're like, he's like, no, we're not doing that. And so they, they say, hey, fine then, man. There's going to be plagues that hit you, and they're going to be bad, and they're going to happen until you let our people go. And Pharaoh's like, well, so be it. Let's see what happens. And so plagues happen. Like I said, you can go read it. It's free, right? You can download it. It's real easy. But eventually, the last plague, Pharaoh says, enough is enough. I'm done. I'm done with this stuff. Get out of here. 
And so Moses and Aaron, they take the Israelites, and we're talking tens of thousands of people. We're not talking a couple of people. We're talking thousands and thousands of people. And they leave Egypt, and they leave out of enslavement and slavery, or out of slavery and into the wilderness. Now, I don't know about you, but slavery doesn't sound fun. But neither does stepping into the wilderness with no direction and no food and no place to stay. Right? So these people are literally stuck between a rock and a hard place here. Because they can't go back, and they're not sure what's in front. But God has said, hey, if you get these people out of here, I have a promised land for them. And Moses knew that, and Aaron knew that. And so we pick it up in verse, chapter 13, verse 20. It says this, After leaving Succoth, they encamped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Now you say, man, this is cool. I like this. Nice little fire thing on there. Helps me visualize things, right? But what is the pillar, what is the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire? It says it in there, and sometimes we gloss over that, and we just read it, and we're like, wow, well, that was cool, and, and you get lost in the imagery of it, but I want you to stop and just see what is in the cloud and the fire. The verse 21 says that by day, the Lord. By day, the Lord. Not a type of him, not a symbol of him, not a picture from heaven, not an angel sent, but the Lord was in the pu- pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, God's presence was with his people. God's presence was with his people. See, sometimes we uh, look at this and we, we understand that the pillar of, of cloud and the fire was for direction and for things like that, but we miss that it was the physical presence of the Lord with people. Now you say, man, well, that would be easy. I would love to feel, see the presence of God. I, God, if you just put a little, you know, pillar of fire right here and a, and, and a pillar of cloud during the day, I'd be good. I'd just make all the right decisions and do what you want me to do. And that would be the easy route, right? But I want you to see that this isn't just an imagery. This isn't just a cute thing. This is the presence of Almighty God with his people, I, got, I, had to, I had to read that a bunch of times to let that sink in. This is God himself. Some theologians and people that study the Bible say that it was the, the, the glory or the, the atmosphere, uh, the light, however you want to describe it, but the presence of God is called the Shekinah, the glory of God, which is, can't be viewed by men. And so many theologians believe that this, this cloud during the day and the fire by night was the protection of the Shekinah glory from God. That because people of Israel, they couldn't look on him, but they knew he was there with him. Man, I want to tell you a story. January, and I've shared this with some and, and others, maybe not, but in January, um, right when my dad ha- got sick and went to the hospital, uh, there was a Friday that I was, he went in on Wednesday, and there was a Friday, and, and things were feeling very wilderness-like and very without direction. And there was a moment where I thought, man, I don't, I don't know if I could do this. And I was driving in my truck, and I was coming back home from the, from the hospital, and I, I just do the only thing that I know to do when I'm in the wilderness with no directions, and it's to call out to God. I said, God, I can't do this. And immediately, I felt an overwhelming presence of the Lord with me. Peace that never left, as a matter of fact, from that day with me. I'm glad it wasn't a pillar of cloud or fire because that would have been a weird wreck. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Ah, You know, (laughs) thank you, Lord, but, you know. But I felt the presence of God with me right there. I wasn't sitting in a church. There was not a beautiful song playing. It wasn't even a Sunday. (laughs) And yet I felt the presence of God with me as soon as I called out to him. You say, well, how does this happen? How does this happen? Here's here's the connection from Exodus to now. John 14, 
Jesus is talking in John 14, 16 and 17. He says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. Catch this. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. Wow, this will preach somewhere. Man, we have the opportunity through the Holy Spirit to call on God Almighty, creator God of the universe, to say, God, I am in the wilderness with no direction, and right there, just like he did with the Israelites with the cloud and the fire, his presence envelops you and swarms you and is with you in those moments. But ladies and gentlemen, the problem is that we forget often that it's available. We forget that it's available. What we see through God's presence is the Holy Spirit is our cloud and is our fire. The same spirit that was with God, the same spirit that was in that cloud and in that fire. When you say yes to Jesus, the Bible tells us very clearly that the Holy Spirit lives and breathes and works in you today. Man, the second thing we see with the cloud and the fire is that it was God's provision and his protection. God's provision and his protection. I'm telling you, there's really cool stuff if you read your Bible. In verse 17 of chapter 13, it says this, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. (laughs) Some of my maps that I've taken take that route. (laughs) It's a shorter route, but why are we going? Anyway, so God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. These, this is so, so God took these guys and gals out of captivity, took them off the path that they would have known, and walked them right into a dead end at the Red Sea. Thanks, God. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So take us away from things that we know. Take us a different path that we didn't know we were supposed to take. But when the cloud moved and the fire moved, the people moved, right? And so they were following and they got into that spot because the Israelites needed God's provision because they had never gone this direction before. When the cloud and the fire moved, they moved. Now, here's what happens in Exodus chapter 14. Pharaoh changes his mind. He says, well, I actually like all that free labor. I'm going to go get you guys. Yeah, you're coming back. We don't want to do this all on our own. And so he sends all of his chariots and his warriors and everybody else out. And he says, hey, go get those guys. Go bring them back. We need our free labor. And so they come and, they, and they're, they're gaining on the Israelites. Remember, God led them right to the Red Sea. And the Israelites are looking back at an Egyptian army that's easily going to overwhelm them, easily going to take them down. No chance. And the Bible says this, this is the, oh man. The Bible says the cloud moves from the front of the Israelites and moves and surrounds the rear in the back of the Israelites to blind the Egyptians from the back and shade the Israelites from their threat. At the same time, the fire provides light for the Israelites See, we read this story in Exodus, and we like to talk about Moses and and splitting the Red Sea, but what we don't sometimes see is that it was the fire and the light by the fire that lit the path as the Israelites walked on dry ground through the Red Sea while the cloud, oh man, I'm telling you, it'll preach somewhere, where the cloud was behind them, protecting them from the enemy, and they walked through in God's provision while the enemy was confused, the path was clear, God brought them to the other side by the fire and the cloud and his presence. Man, oftentimes we find ourselves in a wilderness, And we find ourselves in a spot where we look around and we see nothing in front of us. God, this is a dead end. There can't be anything for me. And then we look behind us and we go, man, everything's coming for me. I can't be the only one that's felt that. Man, God, this, this is going wrong and this is going wrong and this is happening, right? And we forget that we have provision and protection through God's Holy Spirit. We forget that the cloud went before and the fire went before, but when it was needed, the cloud wrapped around behind and said, hey, I got you in the front and the back, homies. We're good, right? And God said, hey, I want to do that for you, not just for the Israelites, not just thousands of years ago, but in the middle of your mess, in the middle of your situation. God wants to light a path in front of you put a cloud of protection over you so that you can walk in his Holy Spirit through what he's calling you to do. 
A lot of times we trust ourselves. <laughs> I have to laugh. I mean, how many times have we done that? Oh, I got it, God. I'll take care of this one. <laughs> I've been there before. <laughs> I know. I know I made a disaster of it last time, but I got it this time now. I learned. We trust the government. <laughs> oh, no, we don't. Nobody trusts the government. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Just kidding. But we trust articles. We trust educators. We trust different things, right? And some of those have good wisdom. But oftentimes we forget to rely on the provision and the protection that the Lord provides us. See, the Holy Spirit brings that. He's our covering by day and our fighter at night. No, I didn't misspeak and say it meant to say fire. I meant to say fighter at night. How many of you guys know that, that battles are waged, war is waged at night? I asked a police officer friend of mine, I said, man, why do you like to work the graveyard shift? He literally, he literally responds to me, he goes, nothing, my friend, nothing happens, nothing good happens at 2 a.m. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, if you want action, graveyard. Right? Because the dark hides things. The dark scares you sometimes. I was walking my dog the other night, and, and she is, uh, she's, <laughs> she's three almost and learning how to walk still. Um, but she, or she was walking me, or I was walking her, one of the two. And uh, she had her ears, she puts her ears in a certain spot. She hardly ever does it. Um, and so you guys that are pet owners know that, like, they have a little sense about them. Like, hey, something's not right. So she puts her ears up like this. And, uh, and then that immediately sends like a little, boo, you know, down my spine, like, oh boy. You know, I'm out in the, it's 10 o'clock at night, I'm walking her. I have one earbud in and one not. I'm listening to a podcast, and all of a sudden I'm like, you know, I think it's probably good that I take both of them out, <laughs> you know? And she keeps looking at me like, do you see what I'm seeing? Do you see this? And, uh, and so I'm getting a little, like, anxious. Like, what does she see in the dark that I don't? Right? What's, what's about to get me is what, I, was what I'm thinking. Now, Granted, with Bailey, it could be a leaf that had just shaken under a bush, and she was like, you know. But the point stands, right, that the darkness brings the covering of bad deeds and bad things. And what the fire does is the fire exposes and brings lightness to the darkness. See, we have a Holy Spirit that God has promised us, that Jesus told us about, and he came through, that says, hey, I'm going to cover you by day, I'm going to fight your battles at night. And the Bible says that Jesus is on the, the hand of the Father, intercessory, intercessory prayer for us on our behalf. So we have God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit saying, hey, I have got you. But oftentimes we forget it. See, what happens when we lean into that and we realize that is the last thing that we're going to talk about this morning is that the fire and the cloud, the Holy Spirit, the presence of God brings a peace. The Bible talks about it as a peace that passes all understanding. Peace in moments where it doesn't make sense. These Israelites are captive. Now they're freed. Now they're wandering in the wilderness. I'm sure they're like, yeah, let's party. And then on the same time, they're like, oh my gosh. I have tons of anxiety because I don't know what we're going to eat, right? Like, you know, that level. And so, in, but in the middle of it, picture this with me for just a second. In the middle of that, imagine the peace that comes when you look through the thousands of people that you're traveling with and you see God's presence in a pillar of a cloud during the day and you see God's presence as a pillar of fire at night and the deep abiding peace that passes all understanding that doesn't make sense in the wilderness, but yet you can say, but God is with me. Man, how many of you guys sleep with a nightlight still? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, me, me too. I, I even went to the, to the thing and like put my light, the plates on your outlets, you know, and made the little lights on the bottom. I'm like, I do not like the darkness. I don't, it's not my thing, okay? And, and oftentimes as kids, it's the same thing, right? They don't want to go in there and shut the lights off and it's completely dark. They want a little bit of light to shine in there. The Holy Spirit brings peace through shining that light into darkness. The Holy Spirit is fighting for us. He's working on our behalf. He's shining light into the dark areas. And so we don't have to worry what's down the hall or what's in the bush or what's coming after us from behind because we have God's peace from his provision and protection and presence. See, now this is all made possible through this moment right here. And if you don't hear anything else, please hear this. 
You say, well, how do we go from the Israelites and the pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire to present day today? And you're talking about this Holy Spirit that lives within inside of us. This is how it happens. God creates human beings. He says, hey, I'm the creator of this world. And he does an amazing thing there. But, but somehow we get separated because we choose early on sinful lifestyle. And that separates us from God's plan. And God says, that's not good enough. I don't want to separate these people from me. I don't want to just push them aside. I want to be with them. I want relationship with them. And so heaven sends Jesus, the best that heaven can offer. And Jesus walks this earth as part God, fully, fully man, fully human, but he's there and he faces all the temptations that we have. He faces all the things that we go through and yet never sins. And God brings him to the point and says, hey, they have a debt that they need to pay because their sin separates me because light can't be with darkness. And Jesus says, I will do it. Read the word, that's what he says. If there's any other way, let's do it that way. But if not, I'll do it. And Jesus takes the sin of the world and the shame of the world and the price that we, you and I were supposed to pay and he dies on the cross and pays that debt for us so that we can be forgiven, redeemed, filled with mercy and grace and love. I've said this many times. If somebody paid a debt that I owed like that, I would say, man, that's pretty cool and that's probably enough. But our God is not a God of just enough. He's a God of more than enough. And so he took Jesus and he buried him in the ground for three days to give him victory over death, hell, and the grave. And then he raised him up after three days so that you and I could say yes to him and have relationship with our heavenly father, have the Holy Spirit inside of us so that we could live life, but not just life, life abundantly and life eternally with him. That's what we call the gospel. That's how we get from Exodus to now. When you say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit begins his work. The Holy Spirit dwells within you. God's presence walks with you. His provision, Romans 8 says this, 8, 6, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The Holy Spirit brings peace. 2 Corinthians 3.17, catch this. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is in the cloud or a fire, there's freedom for those that are enslaved. There's freedom for you in the captivity. There's freedom for you in a wilderness where you're wandering around wondering what's going on. There's a presence that's been promised by the Lord through his Holy Spirit. There's provision, there's protection available for you and you say yes to him. And there's a peace that passes all understanding that doesn't make sense when we can't figure it out. There's an underlying peace that the Holy Spirit provides that we're able to walk in that if we say yes to him. As the worship team comes and we begin to sing, I'd ask you this, this thing that we don't pass through this and, and oh, that was, that was fun to listen to that and, and we got some, something from God. I pray that you would take a minute in the next couple of minutes to really digest it. We do this on purpose, play a song. We call it a personal response time. You can sing, you can pray, you can think about it, but take a few minutes to let God speak to you. And if you're not in a position today where you're like, man, I have never, I've never accepted Jesus. I, the first time I've heard that gospel message and I wanna respond to that, you can do that right now during this time. There's no special prayer. I don't have to bless you. There's nothing that you, I need to do. You can say, God, I have sinned. I have fallen short of the glory of God, but I want a relationship with you. And in that moment, God begins to sanctify you and his Holy Spirit begins to fill you. If you say, man, I'm lost in the wilderness. I'm looking for provision or protection. Call out to God in this moment. God, help me. Guide me. Send me something. A.W. Tozier says this, the Holy Spirit is our cloud by day and our fire by night. Without him, we only wander aimlessly about the desert. Let's not be people that are wandering aimlessly about the desert. And friends, there's plenty of people that go to church that still wander aimlessly about the desert. Don't punch a ticket. Don't say, well, I, I'm here today, you know, so that's good enough. Live by the Spirit. Live by the cloud and by the fire. Say yes to him this morning. Let's sing.